Hello and welcome to the program, Your Life's Journey. My name is CJ. I am the host of this program. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wanted to write a book about your life story but you didn't know how? This is the place for you. We have interviewed somebody very important and special, and his name is Mike Fisher. Did you know that he served our country in the Navy? He was a fighter fighter. He was a coach and a special ed teacher for many people. So we're going to go ahead and watch the clip and take it away. Welcome to Your Life's Journey. Today we are honored to introduce our guest, Mike Fisher, who used to be my teacher as a, in special, special needs. And today we're going to talk about his life story. So Mike, let's go and talk about um, where you were born. Okay, I was born in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1947. I had a pretty normal childhood. We moved to Monroeville when I was Oh, three, and life became a little hectic once we hit school there because it was a it, when we moved there, Monroeville was nothing but dirt roads and everything except Route 22 going through, and uh, it grew so fast. In the uh, six years of elementary school, I went to eight or nine different schools and never moved. I lived in the same house, but went to schools in uh, nine different areas in the area. So there's not much much other, other than that. Uh, it was funny, the kids I grew up with, the kids I grew up with then were Fred and Frank, who we were best friends since we were about three or four. Our yeah. parents took over the Cub Packs. And uh, when I graduated from high school, uh, hundreds of friends went and came and went, but it was still Fred, Frank and I. When we and we still keep in touch today. Well, uh, talk about your uh, your high school years. Uh, what do you remember about your high school years and uh, what activities you were involved in? I was basically your invisible kid at school. They, uh, if it, if when it was football, see, I played football, basketball, and worked. Or it was on the track team. And during that, I was also involved in the Boy Scouts where I was working every weekend up at camp or uh, things like that. But uh, the only time I really felt part of the school was actually school. I was, was when Dora was playing football. Okay. Other, otherwise, I was just an invisible body. Okay. So. What, what did you enjoy most about football? Hitting people. Hitting people. <laughs> No, I, I enjoyed it. it. Just let me let off all my frustrations, and and I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed hitting people. Yeah, and playing the game. I, I right. like like to compete. I was very competitive. It says here that you were in the band as well. Oh yes, I also played in the band. I played trumpet and baritone. Really? I switched to the baritone, and I played a little bit of trombone, but that was only in a couple solos. So, how long were you in that? I was in that for six years too. Six years, really. Uh, junior high and high school. Wow. So you you had to juggle between football and band. Now nah, football took preference. Really? <laughs> I'm sure it did. <laughs> I hold a record. I got the only F in band. Really? <laughs> I wouldn't go to a parade because we had a football game the day before. Oh, so it, it <laughs> I wasn't. Take I did. I, I took yeah. preference to football. And yeah. I could have marched, but I said I'm not marching. I told them when I joined the band that year I really? wouldn't march. So do you want to talk about your college life? Okay. And uh, you went to, to Slippery Rock University College, and you have that you were in a fraternity, TKE. OK, uh, I joined TK, and it was probably one of the best things I did. I became, at the time, you don't realize it's just a bunch of crazy guys doing crazy stuff, stuff you probably shouldn't do. And uh, <laughs> the. Uh, but the bonds that were formed, you know, the deeper bonds, we still get together now, I don't know, 40, 50 years later, we're still getting together two, maybe three times a year. And uh, we got a group of eight or 10 that were there when I was there, 
get together once or twice, and then there's a big one where they, everyone that was ever a teak at Slippery Rock comes. And it's amazing. We've had as many as 40 and 50 guys there. Wow. What was, uh, what was the, the lifestyle? What was it like? Did you stay in, in a particular house? Uh, you guys probably stayed up real late, right? Stayed up real late, slept through a lot of morning classes, had a, had a good time. Uh, the things we were doing then, you never realized the bonds that were formed. It sure. was just crazy stuff that you survived together, sure. some of it. Yeah, Your brothers. As brothers were. Brothers, yeah. Just fools. Now, you, do you keep up to date with these guys? Oh yeah, we, we meet two or three times a year. Yeah. Really, is that right? Yeah. You, you remembering Most of them are retired. And the craziest ones did the best. <laughs> uh, the crazier they were, the bigger their success. Really? Because they were not afraid to try anything or do anything. So you, you did do or dares, a lot of do or dares. Well, no, we just, they just, if they weren't sure about something, they went and did something and made sure they were fine. I mean. Some own multi-national uh, businesses. A lot of them that were the became superintendents of schools, uh, principals, and I was just a lowly teacher. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm sure you made an impact on those guys while you well, were there, right? Hopefully, I did. I did what I was. I felt I was supposed to do. Yeah, I'm sure. I tried. So, did you? Were you there? The Were you there from, uh, uh, like a. a junior to senior? I went there by uh, freshman to junior, and I come back and I had to retake some courses. Okay. And uh, so I came back as a junior and I did my senior year, my student teaching and everything. Wow. I did a year and a half more after I got on. Then I went to grad school because I didn't have a job yet. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. And, uh, I got my master's equivalency, but I didn't get a master's. Okay. Okay. What does that mean exactly? I took enough credits to oh, okay. to get credit for it on my A scale. Gotcha. Uh, you you decided to go into the Navy. What was your decision? Uh, then you went into boot camp and schooling. So let's talk about that a little bit. Well, originally I wanted to go into Marines, and uh, they didn't. I got told I'd score too high in the test. And I don't think the captain, captain wanted too much to do with me after I said, you mean I got to be stupid to be a Marine? And uh, I started to walk out and he said, you're throwing your life away. I said, no, sir. I said, I gave you a chance. I'm going to join the Navy. I walked across the hall and joined the Navy that day. But you were, you were being drafted, so you had to make a right. decision quickly. Well, I had probably two to three months maximum before the Army took me. Really? I got my notices. And uh, I really didn't want to go in the Army. Oh, yeah. My dad had been a Marine. He had been in Iwo. I figured I wanted to be a Marine. Well, you had, you had a background in, in football, so that yeah. boot camp would have been pretty simple for you. Yeah, boot camp was just like, uh, it was hard to keep from laughing because uh, some of the drill sergeants, sergeants or petty officers were screaming and trying to act tough and mean, and it just looked like that I just had trouble when I kept laughing. And, kept getting extra push-ups and <laughs> things like that. So did he make you do extra push-ups? Oh, you went, yeah. Uh, I had one rain. day in one session, he made me do 200 push-ups. <laughs> really? So, and he, I was getting ready to start laughing again, and he was smart enough to walk away. Really? <laughs> <laughs> he said 50 more and walked away. <laughs> oh, my. Well, uh, you, you, you must. it says you must have done something to deserve a letter from the captain. So explain what this letter is all about. Well, one thing I learned in the Navy, that if you do a good job and you do it right, you get benefits. Mm -hmm. You can do things. And uh, there was a submarine that came in that they had a, a, an extreme problem on, which was going to cost them, a, cost them their patrol on time. And a uh, captain that misses patrol on time could lose his command or the weapon, or the responsible officer for it could lose his commands. So this occurred on a weekend when no one was there except for my team that, that I was with, and uh, half the people on the ship were missing. So, so you know they weren't on the ship at the time. Yeah, right. So we did. We we took charge on the job. We uh, 
uh, had to break a few security rules. We had to break because the people that were supposed to be there weren't there to release the equipment we needed. So we got it and did it. And, oh, it's about uh, 24 hours before the patrol, we fixed it. We ran our tests. The submarine was wanting their tests, and I had to go tell our weapons officer what happened. Sure. And I'm thinking, there goes the stripe, here goes. <laughs> well, you saved the day at that point. At that point, but we still broke all kinds of security right. violations. Right. And uh, I go up and knock on the door, and they're screaming at each other and blaming each other oh. in the weapons office. And yeah. the captains, our captain from our ships there, their captain from the submarine, our weapons officer, and a couple other officers are in there. Oh, my. And I had to knock on the door. <laughs> it's a lowly E5. <laughs> Oh, and I said, "Sir, I need to talk to you." And he said, oh, "I got something going on here. It's very important." I said, "It's about what you got going on, sir. I think you need to hear me." <laughs> so I explained to him what happened and what we did, and we left all the proper paperwork at the places. Yeah, but we needed the signatures to approve it. Oh, okay. <laughs> we had nothing approved, and uh, so he sent myself and uh, my two friends on the on my team, and he said, "Don't." He said, get off the ship. I'll put in leave chits for you. Don't let anyone, don't answer your phone for the next three days. Okay. And we come back and we just, he said, when you come back, you tell them you had family emergencies. He said, just leave it at that. Oh, wow. So everything cleared up and that's what uh, Attaboy was for. So uh, you didn't go down in rank. Uh, you, you had a favor with your captain and you sort of were the hero. We right. sort of were, but no one ever knew it. <laughs> the we were behind the, 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 behind the scenes. Yeah, I get it. I get it. That was great. Anything else uh, we need to know about your, your life in the Navy? Well, we got to play football over there. Uh, we had a ship team. We had uh, 1,200 guys on our ship, and we had a team. We played the different bases on Guam, and some of them had 10,000 people on And uh, we won the two years and we got to go to the I got to go to the rice bowl twice once in Guam the rice bowl was in Guam so how did you meet your wife Peggy well we are, when we met she had a uh, she was out with her girlfriends that came to the place I was working at and uh, I kept trying to flirt with her and she didn't want to hear anything of it and so and I didn't get a phone number or anything so I found out after the next day that the girl I walked home with and asked to get Peggy's phone number for me had a crush on me. <laughs> and so that's why Peggy wouldn't even talk to me, hardly. <laughs> but I eventually asked her out and I, from what I gathered, she told her mom, I, I'm gonna let him waste some of his money this time, spend his money, you see? So we went out and we went somewhere to eat and then we were going to go bowling and uh, we get to the bowling alley and she starts complaining about the parking lot it had rained it was buddy it was this I'm going to get dirty I'm going to get that and so she's wearing a mini skirt and she kept complaining so we found a parking spot and we were pretty good distance away so we she got I said wait a minute don't step out of the car I picked her up, threw her over my shoulder, and carried her into the bowling alley over my shoulder, over and shoulder. <laughs> plopped her on the counter in the bowling alley when we came in. Wasn't a good start for our first date. <laughs> well, when you're throwing your uh, date over your shoulder. <laughs> well, it's the old caveman style approach. <laughs> That's hilarious. So uh, after that, did you? What, did that impress her at all? Did that upset no, her at all? It, I don't know why, but she did go out with me again, so we must have had fun after that. So in secret, she thought it was fun. I she guess. She thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> she, she went out with me again, so. <laughs> so you guys continued dating and then finally decided to uh, take that leap. Yeah, we dated for about two months when I left boot camp. We got to know each other pretty good there. So I was gone for three months in uh, boot camp and school, and that's when we decided to, I asked her, 
you know, to get engaged. So. So how did that happen? Oh, I was such a romantic. Well, come on. I want to know the story here. <laughs> we walked in. I, we looked at the rings, and she sort of got the idea. I guess she thought I was going to do something romantic. We walked out of the car, and I said, will you marry me? <laughs> in the car? At the, at the at car. The car at I'm the not car. even sure if we were in it. And she said yes. Yeah, it's shockingly yes. <laughs> so a after that happened, what was it like to continue I guess you were in the Navy, right, at that point? Yes, at that point I was in the Navy, and I. Had, um, okay. we got married between A and C school, and after we got married, she moved, she came down to Damn Neck and lived in Virginia Beach with me. So what was that transition like? Because she had to now move from where she was. Well, to where when we were. moved, we hauled everything, in the, everything we owned in the back seat of a Mustang. 60 Mustang. We moved everything we needed really? to live, <laughs> other than my Navy equipment, which was all down there already. So now you're you're newlywed, and it, it's there's a new transition in your life. There's a new woman in your life, and what, so what was that like? Well, we'd go around and collect empty empty bottles and beer cases and turn them in for the returns for. Oh, big, really? Then we'd have a big weekend after we got enough going on. Okay. Okay. But uh. Other than that, it was real easy. It was really easy. Yeah, but of course, living on E E three money was a little tougher. So E three, what would that be as like a rank? That would be a seaman. Seaman. So a seaman would be like a your minimum pay. No, that there was E one, E two, and E three. Okay. Okay. So I I had college, so I got E three, which was I made, I was going in as a third class petty officer. When I finished that schooling, I got my E4, which was a uh, third class petty officer. And that would, that would uh, I'm sure, bring up your finances. Oh, that bring up help the finances very well. But uh, once we finished school there, I had to go to New London, Connecticut, where I went to sub school for a couple months. Okay. And then from there, we moved to Charleston, okay. South Carolina, where I got on the USS Hundley. So you went to school and for a submarine, and then you were then transferred. I transferred to a submarine tender. Okay. What and is that? What is that? A submarine tender? That's where all the submarines come in after patrol, and before they leave, they get upkept. Uh, all the maintenances are done, and any changes or changes or alterations on your equipment, we would update that too. And would you be working like the day shift, the, the midnight shift? Everything. Really. You, uh, most of the time when I was on the tender, I was on day shift, and unless we had jobs come in. If we did a optical alignment, you couldn't do it before eight o'clock at night. It had to be 12, within 12 hours of the submarine coming in, and it had to be done at night because the heat was, would throw the readings off. Okay. So was anybody under you, uh, were you in charge after a while? Oh, I was, I was in charge of optical alignments because at the time I was the only one that could do them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a team of three guys that I got and everyone thought I was crazy, but Rodney was the smartest technician you ever saw. Really? He was just like a big old country farm boy. Talked like a big old country farm boy, but could tear a radio apart and change everything and redo the radio and boost its amplifier, increase its oh, wow. filters. You did it. He did it just wow. off the top of a head with a couple scratches of his pencil, figured out smart. what to set it up. Yeah, that's a smart guy. I mean, you scored high on your test. But he was smart. He was smarter. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the other guy was our radar. He was uh, the guy that could find anything wherever anything was and get it for you. Right. So I grabbed the two smartest guys in the shop. It wasn't that I was really good. I was smart enough to get the good guys around me. We're going to talk about your teaching now, the years that you were into teaching. So let's talk about this. I know that you were a special ed teacher, but what made you get into teaching in the first place? I, I when I was, I'm trying to think, 14, 13 years old, I started working at a Boy Scout camp. And then I worked there and I got to work with different kids and then uh, I worked there for five four or five years working with kids and teaching 
and then uh, I went from there to a church camp when I got to college and I started working there too and it, it sort of I enjoyed it and I figured you know this ain't a bad way to make a living I agree I mean you're, you're, you're um, helping students hoping you right. know, getting getting uh, ahead in life now, the biggest thing I liked about it is when you could see the kids switch it switch on because most of the kids by the time I saw them they hated school when you say a switch on, you can see it. You can just see their eyes. confidence. Their, okay. their, I'll try it instead of I'm afraid of it or I won't try it. Yeah. They would attempt things. Okay. And you convince them that uh, if someone said they were, when I started out, I taught train, trained to be retarded. And one of the kids' people called me retarded. And I said, well, do you know what retarded means? Yeah. And they said, no. It means I'm stupid and dumb. I said, no. It means you take a little longer to learn it. Mm. It doesn't mean you can't learn it. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means I got to work harder to do it. Okay. And uh, once they realize that, their confidence, and I see them stand up to other kids more. It was sure. Spot. Sure. So you had you got a degree, uh, and what was your degree in first? I got elementary education with a K through 12 special education degree, and then I just all my special all my graduate courses I took in special ed or computer. What was your first teaching job and where? Well, my first teaching job was at the First Christian Church with uh, trainably retarded, and uh, that was then from there we improved the facilities by moving to a Walmo school because we had a kitchen, we had a shop, we could teach the boys, the Ralph could teach the boys uh, skills like that and Sue Spiker was able to run the uh, kitchen and uh, we decided to try to do it as we'd take the kids to the mall and have them pick up orders or order things. We'd take the kids and we finally started a kitchen where we cooked food, made up a uh, menu for each week, started out with two things. And the kids did all the cooking, the kids did all the ordering, the kids did the money collecting. Uh, we had people that came from different places to pick up some food that was pre-ordered. Everything had to be pre-ordered a couple days ahead. And uh, we pitched our own money in, Bernie, Ralph, and Sue and I, yeah. to start the kitchen. Okay. But we actually, took orders from the Shantic High School and would take, they'd come over, someone would come over and pick them up and take them back to the, to the school. Okay. And uh, it was it was a fun experience. And we, we paid the kids anywhere from a dollar to uh, 25 cents an hour for stamping the bill paid. Really? We, we had oh, wow. a variety of jobs from, from almost non-functional kids to uh, kids that were doing all the cooking and that. And when the, I, I left and went to Nishanik High School when the program changed. Uh, okay. The cooks and that were actually making $4 an hour and the variety and range in there because wow. the restaurant was doing that well. So you're, the students actually uh, learned um, like on the job training. They got on the job training and life skills. Wow. And uh, a couple of the kids went to Lark Workshop and just amazed them how well they did. They did wonderful when we when they went on after I'm they sure. got turned 21. Was that like one of the best things about it? That was one. I, I liked it when it was either academic or life skills. Really? You could just see the growth. That was probably my biggest thrill about teaching. When you saw the improvement or they took over their, or their own destiny more or less. It's like when the, like you said before, when the light bulb goes on, you can tell that they got it. Like their uh, their yeah. their their face kind of shines that they, they or, figured it out. Or they stood up to people that were giving them crap before that they used to be. Yeah. Well, they're better than me. Well, they didn't think they were better than right, me before. Right, right, right. As a special ed teacher, what what did you uh, what did you have to go through in order to uh, to teach the kid to had you know. ADD or dyslexia, what was some of the things you had to go through? You had to uh, experiment with different um, 
techniques of approach. Uh, I used to get criticized because I couldn't name all the varying uh, approaches, okay. the different styles of learning. I couldn't name the procedure. Okay. I knew the what they were like, but I couldn't name them. Okay. So they criticized me at one of the special ed interviews things. Okay. And, uh, they criticized that fact, and I said, "Well." He said, how did you decide on that? And I said, well, I tried them until I found it. He says, well, which one did you settle for? I said, I, the one that worked. Because <laughs> <laughs> everybody's what was, different. Yeah. And they said, well, well, what was the name of it? I said, I don't know. And I didn't care. It was the one that worked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, you, 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 I remember you telling me that you, you helped a certain student read upside down. Yes. One day we were sitting there and he's trying to read and and I, he saw me reading it upside down, so he turned the book upside down, and he started reading it fluidly. Here, he was seeing gaps, and it was up. It was. Yeah. He read fluently upside down, and he, and he read fine. This is how his brain worked. Never yeah. was something we thought of. It was just something that worked. So about three days later, I have a raging teacher dragging him by his ear into my room, screaming about him, making fun of her by reading, putting his book upside down, and pretending he's reading. So I said, David, turn your book right side up. And I, he said, I said, read. And he was struggling. I said, turn it upside down. And he read fluently. I said, that's why his book's upside down, ma'am. <laughs> wow. wow. And uh, it was it was all by accident. Yeah. But it was really made a difference for him. I remember when you were, were I, I'm going to switch gears for a second. I remember when you were teaching me math and I saw you at your desk and you were doing math upside down drawing the numbers upside down i was learning fractions upside down with that <laughs> that took some concentration <laughs> you also were doodling he could doodle upside down you could draw little stick figures and, and uh well, i don't know bar wired fence and stuff upside down while he was uh in the other side of the desk well i always thought i was a little dyslexic myself. <laughs> Because I struggled reading and yeah. fluently. I still right. do. Right, right. So but what was the least favorite thing that you enjoyed about teaching? Paperwork. Paperwork. State great paperwork. <laughs> they just seemed to have to, you spend more time doing paperwork and you could, I could, I would, if I did all the paperwork they required, I would spend more time on paperwork than I was on preparing lessons. And when I had a math class, I had five levels of math sometime in the same class. So that meant five different sets of worksheets. I couldn't just go in and say, boom, this two pages, one through 20. Yeah. I had to uh, vary it in, in options. I'd have some, I had some kids that were taking algebra one and algebra two and geometry. And I had other kids that were still trying to learn to add and subtract in a checkbook. I remember you teaching me how to write a check. How did you teach multiple grades in one classroom at the same time? Well, they were all doing checking. Some were writing the checks. Some were just doing the add and subtracting in the check ledgers. Some were doing the checks, the ledgers, and they got a paycheck, the deposits to put in. Okay. So it was all the same subject area. Okay. But, uh, from the beginning level all the way up through that. I never did get the balancing checks, but I never did it myself, so. Sure. <laughs> I, I married a banker. <laughs> That's smart, actually. <laughs> all right, so Mike, uh, you are, you're really into the football thing. You were uh, into the football um, in high school. So now you've gone to high school, to college, and let's talk about professional coaching now. Well, I started in uh, high school. My parents wouldn't let me play midgets. I wanted to. So when I got the first played in junior high, I had no clue what I was doing. I just ran around hitting people and getting penalties. <laughs> uh, by uh, high school then, I got to start my senior year. And then I went to Slippery Rock and played two years there. Uh, when I went in the Navy then, we played, so uh, our coach really wasn't an offensive coach, but 
I was lucky they ran the same one I did in high school, the one, same one I did in college, same offense, so I was able to help them. So we actually became, several of us, one that played at Syracuse, one that played at uh, University of Illinois, then me at Slippery Rock, we, we helped him draw up his game plans and the schemes for the defensive and offensive games. Okay. And uh, so I got my first sort of taste of coach in there when I was playing. And I was one of the little guys, 270. So we wow. had a big team. And they were, it was easy to tell them, just knock them on their butt and take <laughs> But uh, when I got out, I wanted to coach, and I glad you gave me the chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really enjoyed it. It was fun. It's, I coached it, and then basketball. Yeah, Girls exactly. Basketball yeah, for years. yeah. You were a coach for football for quite a while, or a little bit. 15 years. 15 years. And now we're going to switch gears and let's talk about your coaching basketball. Okay, I coached girls basketball at Nishani. And I was lucky because I got to coach when they had a great bunch of girls with a great bunch of talent. And I was basically the JV trainer. And, uh, Wild Bill had the skills for coaching the, var the varsity level. Okay. I was fundamentals. My first team I coached was the JV girls, and my first game that we had, my point guard, that was the first game she played in was the first game she ever saw. Okay. You can tell that we lost 46 to six. We didn't do too well. Wow. But by mid-season, when we played the same team again, we beat them by 10. So the girls developed a winning attitude that they did not like losing. <laughs> and if you do humiliate them, they will come back. You coached the girls basketball. The team uh, lost big and then came back. My JV back. team lost big. And then came back at the end of the season and won, won well. And then you had, you had a couple players that well, you know uh, that are pretty special to you. Yeah, we had, we had, uh, the varsity had some players in ninth grade that moved right straight up. They didn't play JV. They moved straight up to the varsity. Okay. And averaged 20 some points a game. <laughs> so, so who was his? Tammy was Sankey his? was a dominant force on our team. Okay. And uh, we had another girl that ended up going to WNJ and transferred to Westminster and played, who was Jennifer Hannon. Who, when her and Tammy got to, together underneath, they were just deadly. Wow. The two of them, they couldn't focus on one person and the other one would burn them every time. So, so they were like dynamite. They were dynamite. Wow. That was uh, three out of four years of the playoffs. And uh, we were ranked third in the WPIL and didn't make the playoffs one year uh, because of the way they divided the divisions up, double A, single A. Well, you must have been pretty proud. Oh, those girls. They worked their butts off. I mean, we were yeah. very proud of them. And for the core of the team to have never played basketball, we didn't. It was once we got this group, we started running younger training mm -hmm. for the other girls to learn basketball before they became ninth or 10th graders. Okay. okay. So it wasn't, oh, this is basketball. <laughs> <laughs> As you were coaching girls basketball, you had a certain player that stand out. Yeah, actually, we had two, but we had Tammy Sankey, who was average 27, 28 points a game. She holds the uh, scoring record at Nishanik High School. She got a scholarship to North Carolina, and she did well for two years, and then she blew out her knee. Okay. So she ended up, she ended up uh, dropping, you know, dropping basketball because sure. because of an injury. But uh, she was our one of our mainstays. The other one was uh, Jennifer Hannon, who uh, went to W&J and then later transferred to Westminster and played. Okay. Uh, they, they were the core of the team and then we built around them. So, so what was it like to, to be a coach of a girls basketball, but you were you were also a coach of a 
a football team? What was the, the transition, transition was tough. I'd go from football where we were in their face all the time. To the girls having nightmares about me because I was chopping off their hands because they missed shots because I was yelling at them. Oh. <laughs> I, I had to learn to not yell as much that the girls, they didn't handle me screaming at them like yeah, they, they did. Yeah, they, they weren't boot camping. They weren't boot camping camp. football. <laughs> that was a real hard lesson for me to learn. So you also had to teach uh, your kids. Oh, uh, what happened is after I coached basketball for five or six years, the uh, my son come up and says, they, they want to pay, put a basketball team together. I said, well, find wow. some kids that want to play. And they went out and the kids, he had a bunch of kids come and they wanted to play basketball. So yeah. we put some kids together. And uh, there was another boy that was sort of one of our illegitimate kids, we used to call them, that hung out at our house yep, all the time. Yep, they okay. were sort of our adopted kids. Well, the one was almost six foot in uh, sixth, fifth grade. Okay. And he says, what do you want me in basketball? I don't know anything about it. I said, well, I can teach anybody to play basketball. I can't teach six foot one. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's now six foot five. I'm sure, sure. But uh, he was one of the purest athletes we ever had. Yeah. You know, so we put a team together and the first year we got to enter one tournament and we played maybe eight or nine games, you know, during the year, mm -hmm. but they went on to win the tournament. Uh, and it was, that was, that was really an accomplishment. Look at that. You coached a winning team over uh, and over again. Look at yeah, that. That's an was, accomplishment. Well, I had a lot of really talented kids that really wanted to play the game. Well, also when you have a, when you have a coach that really is, is a th thriving for greatness, that, that makes it, you know, they, they want to win for you. Yeah, we had no. uh, we had three coaches or four coaches at a time that were yeah. really working. We could divide the kids up and work individually. You raised two sons and a niece, so go ahead and talk about that a little bit. Well, my two boys, I have Ryan and Todd. Uh, they're I love them both and very proud of them. They they work hard. Everything they've ever worked at, they've achieved well at. They, they're very loving towards their families and that. Let's do Ryan first. He's married to Debbie. They've been married 10 years now. They live in Maui. Wow. He's a, he's a bartender at uh, the Western Resorts. Okay. And uh, it's one of the best jobs there because he, he, he doesn't have to kill himself with ours. Mm -hmm. And they're very uh, flexible for him. Okay. Uh, He's been living there now for quite a while. Uh, then there's Todd. He's been married for 12 years now. And uh, him and April have two girls, Peyton and Paisley. Or should I say they have my granddaughters. I was going to say you're a proud uh, grandfather, aren't you? <laughs> our, our, my favorite job I've ever had is we still three days a week go pick the girls up. I'm sure. And uh, we watched them a lot when they were younger. Yeah. And I feel privileged to be able to have spent so much time with them. And I still love going up and, uh, but I'm watching them start to grow away a little bit. I'm not enjoying that because they're getting older and more mature. It's going to happen, but you, yeah. you are you were also almost like a teacher to them in certain ways. Well, we actually got the, my wife and I, Peggy and I got to be there homeschoolers yes uh, so I was amazed because both kids I don't know if they're gifted but they're borderline gifted if not but they're very 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 smart so the apple doesn't fall from the tree well they far, far from the tree. Well, Ryan and I and Todd and I always say we saved all our brains and gave it to them but uh, Peyton is qualified for the second year to go to nationals wow. in uh, academic games Okay. She did it in fifth grade, and she's going to Florida in sixth grade to compete in the nationals for academic games. Wow. And she did very well in fifth. So. Very good. Very good. And the younger one in third grade is also competing in the academic games now, too. Good. Do you want to talk a little bit about your niece? Okay. Uh, Darlene, we adopted her. We took her in through the courts in uh, at nine years old and raised her. She was... Uh, as it turned out, bipolar schizophrenic. And 
we had lots of issues. And uh, she was uh, a sweetheart. And uh, as things grew worse, everything progressed like it did. She's no longer with us. And uh, it was it was hard, you know, but she, 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 she did well. You gave her a good home. She had a good home. Uh, she went with a, she was on her own when she passed, so. Mm -hmm. uh, we still think of her, our boys grew up and they, they were, until this problem started with her, they didn't even know she wasn't her sister. Sure. She was just one of the family. family. Mm -hmm. So that's basically where that ended. Now that you have uh, retired, what is life like? I, I thought it would slow down. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite, right? <laughs> yes, we, we still babysit three days a week. Go to softball games, soccer games, basketball games, cross country meets because the two girls play on different teams and two different teams in some sports. Uh, traveling teams and local teams and that's a lot of basketball and soccer and cross country <laughs> well you're also babysitting and we're, we're babysitting and uh, but I love it we're able to be part of it and yeah. follow them and get to meet their friends and get to know the kids that they hang out with you decided one day that you wanted to be a voluntary firefighter. So what, what, why did this come about? Well, my dad was a volunteer fireman. And I always said, I, I work for the rescue squad. I work for the fire department. I said, you always need a little bit of uh, excitement in your life and a little bit of blood and gore <laughs> to have a, to live. Okay. And uh, I, I didn't do much with the rescue squad, but I was a volunteer fireman for probably 15 years. I, uh, my, Dad had been one, and I was the number one nozzle man going in usually, and uh, it was exciting. It was fun, and uh, I enjoyed it. Did you have any problems? Did you ever get burned? Did you fall through anything? Did anything fall on you? How did it? I mean, like that must have been a, a really serious thing to. Well, I got scared first. twice. Okay. I went to a fire, at a garage fire, and we were in fighting. And one day, the guy that was my backup disappeared. He left. And uh, they shut off the main big hose. And I'm, I'm running an inch and a half by myself, or two and a half by myself. Okay. And when they shut off the main hose, that old two and a half lifted me off the off the ground and set me back down. So you, you want like and this? And I you turned around and told the guy to grab the hose that there's nobody in there. Oh. oh. And that one scared me a little bit. I was afraid the roof was collapsing anyway. Right. He was supposed to be watching. Well, he left and didn't tell me. But uh, the other one, I went in. We had body searched the house for kids upstairs. And we weren't sure if they were home. We didn't know anything. We couldn't find anybody. Well, after we got the main fire knocked on in the first floor and the other side of the house, we went back in and body searched. Mm -hmm. Well, as I went under the under the bed, into the bunk bed on the bottom bunk and into the closet and all that stuff. I didn't find anybody. And I start at the bottom of the bunk bunk bed yeah. on the top bunk. Boom, someone sits up in the bed. Oh, wow. And it just scared the living crap out of me. And uh, I look over and it's a teddy bear. I hit his feet and it sat up. Well. I won't say I had to change my pants, but... <laughs> you were close. I was close. It, it, it turned you white. <laughs> and uh, scared me because I went through a fire Yeah. and thought I missed the body. Or a kid oh, that would have been alive. Sure. He Makes could sense. have been dead because the smoke smoke was really bad up there. I had a mask on. This kid didn't, wouldn't have. So it might he might not have survived if there was one. Sure. The other one that incident... I wasn't scared, but I scared the heck out of my family. Is uh, I went into a fire on Main Street in Grove City, a paint shop caught on fire. And uh, my kids saw me going into the fire and they saw hoses coming out and they saw everything going back and never saw me come out. I went out through the back 
grabbed a different hose, came in and went to the second floor. You were still in the building, and they didn't leave, but they were probably still wondering where, where you were. Yeah, they, okay. they, they, and then I finally came out the front door once we knocked on the second, the row along the back walls. Did you, uh, did you fall through a, a, a roof? No, I, uh, we were in a fire where the, f the bedroom upstairs burnt the center of the floor out. Yeah. I went in and I stuck my foot out because we stepped the step of fill. I felt there was a, there was a gap. So I went around and, uh, but the guy that came in after me, I told him about the floor. And uh, the guy that came in after him, he didn't bother telling him. So this guy tries to walk across the middle of the floor and goes through the first floor, through the second floor, through the first floor, and ended up in the ductwork oh, wow. in the basement. Okay. And he come out of there without a scratch. Really? I ended up going and getting 15 or 20 stitches in my hand because when I vented and opened the window, the window was painted shut. So I took my uh, nozzle broke out the window and broke out the glass pane. Well, the second, the uh, storm window, I'm dying and guillotined by hand. I had oh. cut, proof, cut, proof, cut proof gloves on that were supposed to be uncuttable, but sure. they managed to go through anyway. Sure, <laughs> that was a triple It was no biggie. Uh, yeah. I come out and I said, I might need to do something. They said, what do you mean? I took on my glove and dumped all the blood out. <laughs> oh, no. And I had a pretty good gash on my hand. And really? They wrapped it, and I drove myself over to the hospital and okay. got it stitched. Wow. But it was really nothing. It was better in a couple weeks. Sure. You must have really enjoyed that as a firefighter. It was, uh, it's, it's exciting. It breaks the boredom in a small sound. It's a rush, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I got to repel down a couple, or a truck on 80 one day when they wrecked. We oh, repelled wow. down the back of the truck, the, the guy in a stretcher to pull him out of the truck. Wow. Well, you've been through a lot, Mike. <laughs> well, that was my Navy training, too, because I was on the assault team on nuclear spaces. So you you were a Navy, you were in the Navy, you were a teacher, you were a coach, a firefighter. I mean, you, 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 have, a, you have a good good life you, you married a good woman you had kids and yeah. um so you know fantastic so, and through all of it there were still boy scouts so last but not least talk about your uh involvement in boy scouts well starting all the way back in elementary school my, my mom ran Cub scouts with my best friend's parents mm -hmm. then i went in my dad was the scout master with our troop which for all that time. And then I worked at Boy Scout Camp for until I went to college. And then uh, my boys wanted to go into Boy Scouts, so I became a scoutmaster with the troop in Grove City. It was a, it was an experience. Both of them made Eagle. We actually had, uh, I think it was seven Eagle Scouts come out of our troop in a, like a 13 or whatever year the troop was while I was in it. And uh, I had also good scout masters that covered me all the time too. And uh, but both boys made Eagle, and it's actually helped them. And it's you know with their things. So the Eagle Scout, I've, I've heard this from a lot of different people, that actually helped with their life. It uh, in the Navy, it got me a better position when I was going through boot camp. It gave me a leadership position. It helps that person, that young person, develop skills that they're going to need in the, in the job. It also shows a commitment to a something because it's not easy. Okay. There's an awful lot of work. I only made life, and all I needed was a couple easy merit badges, and I could have had it. Right. But I wasn't committed to that. I, I enjoyed working at the camp. Right. Because I worked at the camp all the way up through college. Right. And uh, from there, I went and uh, started working at the church camp up by the college okay. when I was there. So that, you know, gave me teaching experience. Okay. So, but the Boy Scouts basically was where I got the whole start. Okay. And uh, you enjoyed the teaching. Yeah. 
And it change. ran from kin- it ran from kindergarten all the way up through. Oh wow! Boy Scouts wow, very good. for me, you know, it just seemed I always ended up there. Wow! So you really enjoyed yourself. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the biggest things uh, uh, at at the time of your life is, is you got to work with your wife on the side a little. Bit. Oh yes, we had a photography business for 30, 20 years, and it was pictures by Peggy. But we we, we well, we were thinking of names. We figured mugshots by Mike, but that wouldn't work. <laughs> so we went That's pictures good. by Peggy and mule by Mike. <laughs> yeah, and I actually I actually worked beside you guys a few times. Yes, you did a lot of work with us and for us. I enjoyed that too. That was fun. And, uh, we enjoyed it. We we started out just doing sports pictures, and I guess we were well over 300 weddings when we got wow. done. So wow, it was. We did photojournalistic, which was different than most at the time. I, I think uh, I think it got you were more close to 500 at that point, weren't you? Oh yeah, I guess it could be. I quit counting. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I just knew when. I we mean, s- three, 300, 500. That's that's a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> we switched over from film to digital, and we realized that we were running out of closet space to store all the negatives. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so you actually had to go and get everything developed the old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned way when we started. Digital. Yeah. To sum everything up, what would you what would you like to say? Well, I, I, I look at my life as I did what I committed to do. I committed to teach, and what I thought was what I should do, I should do. Uh, whether a lot of times I didn't have agreement with some of my supervisors, they thought I was doing things that they didn't approve, but I always felt that I was doing what I needed to do. And I always, in the Navy, whether it was Navy or school, uh, school the second time, I committed to uh, doing what I w- was set to do and how I felt it should be done. Not, not what necessarily I was told to do. Okay. Well, you've said to me and you've said to your wife uh, multiple times that you don't think that you've ever made a difference in anybody's life. And we've, we've learned that you are, you were in the Navy, you were a coach in both football and basketball, you were a fighter fighter, and you, you went into business with your wife with picture, pictures by Peggy, and you were also a scoutmaster at that point. So what, what would you like to say to the people that are watching about your life's journey? Well, my life journey's changed in October of 69. I actually focused. I had a, a reason for doing something more than just, I feel like it. And then, I had to use my wife to get me back into college. I had uh, an academic and social probation in my, I had to go back to the review board to get back into school because I didn't do well my last year. And uh, they said, what makes you think you can make it this time when you couldn't do it before? And I turned and pointed to my wife who was sitting there holding the baby and said, she'll kick my butt. So. They said they'd give me a chance. Yeah. And then another thing I feel, and I was thinking about this this morning, and I was a lot of the things I get credit for were initiated, planned, and encouraged or even thought of by her. She's one of these people that wants to help everybody, she thinks. She can help everybody and do it in a loving way. Well, you can, but you also learn that tough love sometimes come in. Because I was sometimes considered the heartless blankety blank. <laughs> and, uh, but she always, the pro- uh, she's a people person and is always willing to help anyone she can. And, and drove me more to a lot of the things we did yeah, sometimes we had, we, well, the thing was we had to agree on it. And uh, 
we we've taken both sides in both case in some cases opposite sides sure but we've always come out in the middle when it worked out she's always been your helpmate well she's been my driving force something mostly yeah oh well, i couldn't do it without peggy so and she she brings out more heart in me <laughs> than usually appears. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. That's what a wife does. That's that's why she's so good at it. I always just did what I did because I did it, not necessarily thinking, and then she puts emphasis on where it should be. Well, we're going to end it with this. There are some people who would like to say thank you for what you did in their life, and we're going to go ahead and take it away. Time. So, Michael Fisher... So we grew up across the street from each other. He is my cousin who I think is either five, maybe six years older than me. So there wasn't a lot of playtime together. Uh, but he had a paper route. And probably my favorite memory of Michael is that he had a paper route. And I think it was on Friday, Fridays, he would collect the money for the papers. And he would come to our house first, which was across the street. Uh, our dads were brothers, of course. and. Uh, he would grab me and he'd say, come on, you want to go with me? I don't think I ever turned him down. It was always fun. And we would walk his entire route and collect uh, the money for the newspapers. And the fun part was we'd talk, talk the whole time, tell stories, just have a good time. Again, tremendous age difference, but he was always so kind to me and so nice to me. And after, I don't know how long it took, whether it was an hour, hour and a half, two hours to walk the whole route, we would stop at a bowling alley uh, that was on the at the end of the route, and he would buy me a treat, either a candy bar or a soda or both. Um, and I, all the people that were on his route were all, our neighborhood is very tight, so we all knew everybody. And uh, it was a lot of fun to go with him. We, we'd go into some houses and they'd feed us. And uh, it was just, it was a cool time. Then later, he got engaged to this chick, uh, Peggy. Wow, that was, I'm sorry. Anyway, we love Peggy. And, uh, he invited me to be in his wedding. And I think I was 16 years old at the time. And he had a bunch of his uh, college buddies there. and But they all treated me like I was one of them. I mean, they were just, they couldn't be nicer to me. And uh, they tried to get me after the wedding. They wanted me to follow Mike and Peg in my car uh, to figure out where they were and where they were going and all that kind of stuff. And so I jumped in the car and I started chasing Mike and Peg after the wedding. And somewhere along the way, Mike pulled over. I mean, my car was very recognizable. And he pulled over and we talked. I don't know if he paid me or just bribed me to say, leave me alone. Don't listen to those guys. <laughs> and so I sat there for a while. I left them leave. And then I turned around back and I just told everybody they lost me on the roads. And we, like I say, our, our playtime, our, our time spent together was not a lot because... We just, the age difference was too great. Back then, that's that's forever. Nowadays, we get a kick out of remembering stories. I remember they, they he had a bunch of friends in the neighborhood. Uh, I think they were in high school at the time. They were on the football team, the high school football team, Gateway. And they started mouthing off. And his dad, my dad, some other dads uh, came out all together. And he got all his buddies together. And they played football in our backyard. Um, and they were politely handed their butts in a sling, let's just say. Uh, the dads did not coddle them, they didn't baby them, and they beat the snot out of them. And again, it's just one of those funny stories. They they were tough. His dad was Marine, my dad was Army, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't sugarcoat it with these guys. But uh, yeah, just just nothing but fun stuff. We, used to, we played baseball in my backyard. We had a baseball field up. I remember Mike hitting home runs because he was so much older than the rest of us, but it was cool to watch him hit a home run. But yeah, uh, that's that's pretty much my recollection of my my cousin. I love him. Uh, I love him to death. He was just he's a favorite guy. I know I could ask him for anything and he'd do it. Um, but yeah, it's just it's pretty cool. Two more pictures of Phil Mont, so you can kind of get a feeling for for that trip and the involvement that we had. Uh, lower right hand picture there is Mike at his tent. I think we tented together and getting his gear ready to go. Um, let's see. Oh, hiking the trails up there at, at Philmont. And um, 
we went to a, um, a World War II bomber airplane that crashed into the mountain up there and fishing and things like that. Um, oh, some other stuff. Uh, yeah, stayed at Air Force bases, um, military bases, you know, both coming and going. A plane that we were looking at at one of the bases. And so that was, was pretty much it. Really an exciting trip. And again, and again, like I say, it's, it's one of those, one of those events in your life that just sets the mold for who you're going to be and where you're going to go and, and um, kind of where you want your future to be, even though you don't know it. And that was the case, I, I believe, for, for Mike and the way, way that he got involved. We went, we grew up together. All of us kids there in Caruso Plan grew up together. Not many people moved away. It was a pretty stable kind of a community there. And we went through grade school, junior high, high school, played football together. And, and then as high school graduation came, then we started to spread out. Thoughts on Mike Fisher by Bill Gervin. Mike and I worked together at Nishanik schools for many years. Mike was a special ed teacher and I was an elementary guidance counselor. He also coached basketball at the Nishanik for the girls teams. As a special ed teacher, he had a great influence on his students. Many still keep in contact with him. Mike is very smart and could work with the students in any subject and at any grade level. He was also very patient, which is very important when working with special needs students. He also has a very good sense of humor. He knows how to keep things light when working with these students. Great special ed teachers are rare and Mike was one of the best. Also, either Mike and I were geniuses as coaches. We worked hard to be there and directed our players. Mike was good at being a trainer and he helped the players if they got injured. He helped them get back in action as soon as possible. Working with Mike was a lot of fun. He is one of the most easygoing fellows you would ever meet. In many years we worked together, I don't think we ever had a disagreement. Finally, Mike is a great husband and father. He knew that Peggy was the boss and he had better listen to her. That is something we both know about our wives. He and Peggy did a great job raising their boys, and now they are grandparents. And he also brought his sons to Saturday practice. They were a lot of fun to tease. They knew me as Wild Bill, because that's what Mike always called me. Knowing and working with Mike was great fun. We have also had some great times fishing together on the Nishanik Creek and some ponds at the lakes. I always outfished the fish. I am glad we are still friends after all these years and that we can still get together as old guys and have fun. Mike is probably one of the best men and human beings that I've ever known. Um, he was my assistant basketball coach for several years in high school. And I earned a full scholarship to UNC Chapel Hill, the Tar Heels. And Mike probably, or, or lovingly known as Fish, um, he probably assisted me in making my um, post game a whole lot better. Because if you knew Mike when he was younger, he was, he was a brick wall. So um, Mike is a <clears throat> truly passionate man. Um, he was there for all the right reasons. Um, he loved what he did. And more importantly, he loved who he was doing it with. Um, you know, he was a great teacher, a fabulous coach. And like I said, more so even to this day, um, a fabulous human being. Um, he always came to practice in a good mood. He, we always used to pick with him because he, he acted like one of us. You know, he was one of the kids and uh, he would play with us and, um, and often Oftentimes we didn't have 10 at practice, so he would he would join in. And like I said, Gervin, who was the head coach, he'd get so mad at him because he, he would just lose his head. And uh, we had, I remember, I, I believe her name was Brenda. She was one of our point guards and she was tiny. 
okay? And sometimes <laughs> he would block her or, or you know, uh, block her shot. And Gervin used to get so mad at him. But um, Mike Fisher is, is one of the best men I have ever known. Um, compassionate, um, loving, um, just, and a great teacher. I mean, he did a job that most teachers would have been burnt out on or, um, you know, had trouble with day in and day out. But even his students um, absolutely adored him. And, and like I said, he was there for all the right reasons. And I know that he's always been a, a great father and a wonderful husband. And um, I know him and Gervin have remained friends um, after all these years. Um, he's just he's just an outstanding human being. And they don't make men like Mike anymore. They really don't. You know, he, he's one of a kind. And of course, he served our great country. And, you know, he was an athlete himself for so many years. And he was a kid at heart and still is, I'm sure. Um, he came, I was, let's see, it was 2019. I had to look at my plaque to make sure. I was honored in the Lawrence County um, Hall of um, Sports or Sports Hall of Fame or whatever it is. And Mike came. You know, he didn't have to. It was a 30 or 45 minute drive. I hadn't seen him and Peggy in years, but you know, they came and they're just great people. Okay, so I had Mr. Fisher, Mike, from eighth grade through 11th grade, had him for three years. And like I said, he was pretty much my for every class, especially math. Um, and I can go into a couple of specific stories that still pop out in my mind, one in particular actually, which wasn't even academic related. He probably wouldn't even remember, so I hope he sees this. But anyway, um, anyway, so yeah, he was honestly probably the first and probably the only teacher, even through college, that um, he would come in before school, he would stay after school with me. I, I don't even think, I know for a fact he had my mother on speed dial like they would talk all the time. I'm surprised nobody even wondered anything was weird there. That they would talk all the time because he cared. He really cared about me. Um, and it was more than academically. He got me through, I mean, yes, he got me through the classes, especially the math ones. He got me through the terrifying eighth grade English teacher, Mr. Marburger. I can't believe I even remember his name. He had to have been 90 years old when I had him, and that was 20 years ago. So... <laughs> Probably the only one there that probably was older than Fitch. <laughs> um, that's funny. I don't even remember his name. But anyway, outside of even academically, he was there for me. I, I want to say on a personal level because I like to fight. I was a fighter in high school. And every time I got in trouble and I had to get rolled to the principal's office, my mom or dad, actually it was, when it came to getting in trouble, it was one of my dad. Academically, it was my mom. So fights and stuff like that, it was always my dad on one side. And we would be sitting there talking to the principal and randomly in, uninvited, and anything, here would come Fisher. So the things that Mike's done for me is just amazing. And we still actually, to this day, occasionally will talk. He, um, he's watched me grow up through Facebook. He's kept in contact with me. He still gives me advice when I had when I was going through my divorce, when I had my first child. Those are the things that matter. How many people have printed? Oh my God, I'm 36, so I had him 16, 26, 30, at least 20, 25 years. I've known the man, and for 20, 25 years, he's always been there. He even came through. I remember one time while I was in college, I went to Millersville. And at this point, he was, I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but I think he was driving a bus for, um, I forgot what the name of the school was, but it was it was essentially a jail for kids. I can't remember the stupid name of that school. We played them once, but anyway, and he had to drive out there and he hit me up and we actually ended up going out to Park City and had lunch. And this is back in college. I mean, this was 10, 12 years after I had him then. So, and to this day, I still talk to him. I love the man. He's a great guy. He's taken care of me a lot in my life. And when I got approached to do this, I couldn't say yes fast enough. And I'll always be great. Mike Fisher is a rock. There's no other way to say that. Um, 
He came at a time in kids' lives when often they were feeling less able to do the work that they were asked to do. Um, they felt sometimes that they were less able to be a part of what the other friends of theirs were doing, the other peers in their class. And so that being said, they started to feel less about themselves. And Mike and I just <laughs> wouldn't have that. Especially Mike, um, he didn't want them to feel that way. Um, he valued them, I valued them, and we wanted them to feel that way as well. Mike's a big man, but what's even bigger than his size is the size of his heart. Um, he stands up for what he believes in, and sometimes he had to buck the system. Um, telling the administration, telling other teachers what they needed to help us do to provide the best programs for the students. Um, he always calls a spade a spade. You know exactly where you stand. And what he did with kids too was that he called them out on the things that they shouldn't do or maybe the things that they weren't doing. But he was always there, reach out that hand and grab them in and say, I'm here to help you be better. I'm here to help you with the things that you can't do. Um, there, there's absolutely no artifice in Mike Fisher. Um, he's always been that rock of stability. Um, for me as a colleague and as a friend, he shared his strength with the students and with me. Um, we all became stronger through those bonds. Um, I, I can't say thank you enough to Mike Fisher and all the things that he did for students and continues to do. He went to their games, he went to their plays. He and I actually even have gone to uh, plays by former students that are now, that's their profession. And we continue to do that. Mike reached out along with his wife, Peggy, and their business to work with former students and work for former students and maybe photographing events that they were involved in, including their weddings. And so Mike's connection with kids didn't stop in the classroom. It continued in their lives and he continues to care about students now. Whenever we get together, we always start saying, have you heard about this kid? Have you heard about this one? because they still matter to us, even though they have grown into adults and may have children of their own. So, as I said, Mike is a rock and he has been a great blessing to me and all the students that he's taught. So I thank you for wanting to do this. And we really do need to showcase Mike Fisher, the man, the teacher, and the friend. Thanks. What did Mike Fisher do for me? As I look back at my, my time with Mike, um, it's very difficult calling him Mike, it's Mr. Fisher. Um, but I was never the greatest with reading, math, any of those subjects. Um, obviously all re required reading. Um, I went down after school. I spent a lot of time with Mike so that I was able to stay eligible to, to do after school sports. Um, without him, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I didn't make a big splash in the sports world. Uh, I had fun uh, playing in high school, but he always drove me to do more, to do better. He gave me a different way of looking at things, which was a huge help. What struck me even more was a speech that Mike had given at my Eagle Scout ceremony. He came, he spoke at my ceremony, and uh, it just it, it, it touched me that he cared enough to be there to do that. And, you know, later in life I got to meet uh, his boys, I got to go to one of his boys' eagle ceremonies, and uh, it just means a lot to be able to connect with somebody on that level um, 
that level of respect and admiration. And even to this day, if I run into Mr. Fisher at Walmart or uh, around town, I always enjoy stopping, taking the time to talk to him, to listen, to learn uh, more. You've never done learning. And I've taken that into the, the field that I, I chose as a, as a living, as a special education teacher. Um, never satisfied with just that one answer. That, that might not be the right way to get kids to go and uh, help them understand or process that. So there's always finding a new way of getting there. And that's what he did for me. He never gave up on that. He always found a different way to do it. And uh, it just made an impact on me. That, that I could never repay him. So, uh, Mike, Mr. Fisher, uh, God bless you. Thank you. And uh, you've made a positive impact on a lot of people. You may not think it, and I know as a, as a teacher, uh, oftentimes we're very humble, and we don't feel that we've made those connections, but you have. Uh, what you do matters. You're important. Thank you for everything. Hi, I'm Jess. I've known Mike since I was in junior high school. I was a good friend of his younger son, Todd's, and I was lucky enough to become sort of an extended member of their family for quite a long time and be welcomed by Peggy and Ryan and Melissa uh, in my youth. So when I was reflecting on how Mike has impacted my life, it made me think about how there are some people who just aren't quite center stage for everything, but are there in the frame every single time it matters and I live on the other side of the world now I'm in Australia and so Mike hasn't gotten to see a lot of my great joys and triumphs as an adult in life but you bet your ass he was there when the chips were down um, I grew up and sadly there were quite a lot of times I needed a helping hand and Peggy and Mike opened their home to me so many times in so many ways and I never felt judged and without any questions at all whether that was a couch to sleep on or a meal after a soccer game or being invited along to a family vacation um, and I have so many wonderful memories of being a young kid and spending time with their family and seeing sort of what that beautiful family situation could look like. Mike is an amazing example of a husband and of a father. He's got a great big hug and a big heart and wise eyes and a laugh that fills the entire room up and makes you want to laugh along too. My aunt, who was like a mother to me, died unexpectedly um, last month. And with no notice, I flew home to the States for her funeral. And without even asking, Mike and Peggy were in the room there just to show their support. Still, 30 years later, which I think is just amazing. I was asked to mentor my daughter's friend. And I wrote her a letter and I explained that the people that really shaped my life were my friend's parents as I grew up and that I'd be honored to kind of help be that sort of person for her. Um, and Mike was always that person for me. I've seen him every time I've been home and I think I always will. So thank you for your mark on my life. Mike Fisher had, a, had an incredible impact in my life. He was like the father I never had. He was, he was there for everything. Uh, that made me successful. He was the, he was as responsible for a lot of my success through scouting. Is uh, I, I learned a lot in life, a lot how to be a man. I was raised in a single parent household, and without him, I, I'm not sure how it would have turned out because my my mom worked all the time, so to to keep us boys uh, fed and clothed. So. With that being said, she relied a lot on the outside sources and Mike and Peggy Fisher were amazing people. And um, I loved having having Mike in my life. He, he taught me a lot. He helped me uh, blaze the, the trail for me to become a man. And without him, uh, I wouldn't be who I am today. He, he does have a lot to offer without a doubt. He's, uh, he's got a kind heart. He's got a great sense of humor. He's just an amazing man all around. He always has been. Uh, I have so many memories of him. I have so many pictures of him. Ironically, we share the same birthday. We have the exact same birthday. 
And I, I, I've always, I've, I've, for some reason, I've never forgotten his birthday ever. So that, that alone has helped me stay connected with him. Um, I have been friends with him. I have been friends with his wife. I've been friends with his children. Um, and actually friends is not a great term. I would consider them all family. They're, they are without a doubt um, a member of my family and, and always have and always will be. Uh, I would do anything for them, no matter what they need. Um, just because of the impact that they have had on my life, the the positive and uh, the energy that they give off. Every time you see them anywhere, it is always a great experience, no matter where you run into them at, you know, no matter where you see them, whether it's the grocery store, whether it's a, you know, a fundraising event, it, it doesn't matter wherever you run into them at, it's always pleasurable. It's always wonderful. And I, I would, uh, I would, I would honestly say that I, I could count him as, as the father I didn't have without a doubt, without a doubt. He is, he is that guy and always will be that guy. Um, he made my childhood what it is and I'll never forget it. Hello, Mike. It's my turn. I just want to thank you, first of all, for serving our country. And I have a respect for all servicemen and women that have fought for our freedom, for our country. I thank you so much for that. And I thank God that I had a chance to meet you about six or seven years ago. What a privilege. What I found about you that was most interesting is your sense of humor. And it really helps, especially in these times of tr troubles and struggles, that your sense of humor sort of helps bring a balance. Not that I'm not serious, but I think uh, a sense of humor is good, especially now to help get through these times. I also see that you're such a gentleman. I remember the one day that I was getting out of the car and you put your hand out for me to, to help me get out of the car and I wasn't used to that kind of gesture. So I was really blessed by that gesture that you did. It was amazing. I was like, oh, wow. And, um, but it, it was, it was nice. And, um, and I can see you as being a wonderful father and I know that you care and I know that you, you have helped a lot of people, especially those that have had um, physical limitations. And I just think that's awesome because I myself grew up with uh, physical limitations. And I, I don't recall having anybody, any teacher that had a heart like yours that would help a student get through instead of just pushing them through. So I was really blessed to hear that there are um, teachers like yourself that do care about the kids and their future and to encourage them that they have a future as well and they can do just as well if only someone gave them a chance and you're one of those people that gave these um, children a chance for a future and um, but I, I see you as a, a great father image and uh, I know that this world is hurting for fathers, so I see you as a, a good role model uh, for for fathers. And um, and there's a lot of kids out there that need one, so I just see see you as a great role model and a loving husband. I see that, and I just appreciate you helping me and your wife helping me with the projects that I've had to do. So I just, um, all around, just thank you for everything. Thank you for being you. And above all that, I praise God and I thank God um, and give him the glory and honor. And I thank him for this connection. And um, all I can say is God bless you and keep up what you're doing, a natural. One of the things about my dad from from day one that I remember he is he's always supported me in any endeavor that I've that I've come into. Um, if it's from scouts, soccer, 
Um, anything at all. He, he's always he's he's always been one of my biggest cheerleaders, so to speak. No matter what it is, even if he, I mean, he he grew up playing football, and I played soccer. He was always he was always sitting there on the sidelines, yelling and hooting and hollering just as much, even though he may not have known anything about soccer. Whenever he started with me, with my brother Todd, he knew a little bit a little bit more about soccer, so he could <laughs> kind of get a little bit more involved with it. But with with me, he was still there supporting me, hollering, hooting, and everything else he could do. Through scouts, I I'm an Eagle Scout, thanks to him. I don't know. It's 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 hard to put it into words how much he he has affected me. But it's I mean he really has affected me immensely on the man I am now. I believe that he's sort of brought he he's had a significant part of making for my more my morality, my gift to gab. Obviously, even whenever I moved to uh, Europe <laughs> by myself, no money. My dad's like, well, hell, you're going to have a good time. Figure it out. <laughs> In my head, I may have been freaking out. My mother's like, don't do it. Don't do it. He was still like, hey, you know what? You got to make your decisions. You got to grow. And that's that's part of me that helped me be the person I am. Knowing that even if I didn't necessarily knew, know what was going on, even if I failed, I could always come back to come back to my 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 home base being my family even <laughs> even coming out to Hawaii even out coming out to Hawaii I mean it was sort of at a my buddy and I talking about it and we planned on staying for one year and and, I, and it's made it's made it for my my forever home without his support I, I probably would have never made that jump to try to make make Hawaii my home and thus finding my wife Debbie finding everything that all the all the happiness and the and the just the amazing opportunities that I have here to, I mean I, I wouldn't be a third of the person I am now I mean there's it's, there's so much to say in such a short period of time I, I I mean I love him with all my heart all my soul and I'm appreciative to everything that he's given to me I you see you see you see those little those little memes where you have the the person half full and the and they're they're building up the kid and stuff like that. I mean, the amount the amount of the amount that he's given far outweighs what he gets just in, in life in general. So I just wanted to let him know that I love him with all my heart and I appreciate everything he's done and he's made he's made me the man I am today. Uh, even even though I may be flawed in some areas, I know that it's okay because he's also made me know that it even even whenever you're not necessarily perfect at A, B, or C, you know what? It's okay, and you can always thrive to make it, make yourself better in any manner. What I first memories or whatever I have going back is back when I was a football coach back in Mechanic. Um, I'd be the little tag along, little four or five year old running around uh, all the woods up in Mechanic and uh, just watching them coach football and everything. And um, I played basketball, rode my bike in the woods. I remember coming in bloody from wrecking my bike in the back cross country woods and kind of fixing me up and moving on. Um, and then we were definitely in scouts growing up throughout the years. Um, my mom was part of the Cub Scouts. My dad was the Boy Scout, so I got to be the young and going in um, in the scouts. And, biggest thing with scouts I remember was just a lot of camping trips and a lot of outdoors and you know one of the biggest memories when I was so young was went off to merit badges and everything I got to go uh, fishing back in there so um, we still to the day go to some of those fishing lakes and everything and uh, get muddy fall down and last summer we tried to drag into the, uh, the old beaver pond and it was not the same uh, walking ability it was and everything. You know, I remember we were climbing and everything, following just last summer, walking around the lake in front of me. It's like, okay, I'm done. You can fish. I'm going to go hang out up there. So um, some of those memories definitely uh, are very good ones from scout camp and everything. And continuing on the scout thing was um, one of the biggest things in my life was the car accident. Um, and uh, it was me and my dad that were 
I kind of rode with him just to kind of give him someone to be with on the way up and uh, remember everything from uh, right after the accident, looking at him and seeing the steering wheel all curved over to uh, being in the hospital. My dad giving him rock work dates and everything, and we'd always make fun of him on that. But I'm doing it now with my kids. I don't know which one's which, so I guess we're similar in that realm. Um, but then even through the hospital, it was just kind of that person there that kind of helped me through things. When things got rough, he was the one that was the strong one and uh, got through it. Um, and then even after that, I was playing soccer and everything, and I remember I had a strict rule of not being allowed to hit the ball. And I was my first game, and I go in for a header, and I took it off my chest instead. And, I looked over, my dad was out of the seat, ready to come after me for uh, doing something that I told him I wasn't going to do. So, um, but honestly, it was both him and my mom, both the ones that were at every single event I was at. They literally chased me around to every game, um, whenever our soccer tournaments all over the country, to basketball games, to this and that. Uh, they both chased them all over the place, and um, my dad's mom are still the ones that are front and center uh, at my girls games um, whenever uh, they've got basketball cross country uh, day-long activities that's always they're always there still chasing and uh, uh, they never never missed a game throughout the years um, and even even today now with my girls and everything uh, it was, I remember when the girls were young, it was, uh, my dad was working with George Jr. Uh, with the kids, but then uh, after, actually, it was a, a motorcycle accident that ended up, uh, I think, changing to be the point of being, okay, I need to be here with the grandkids, and literally, he's here almost every day, he's upstairs, so I'm doing this, and just ready to get dinner. Uh, but always with the girls, I uh, love the grandkids, uh, chase them around. Um, we never really had girls. And, uh, it took a little bit of getting used to having girls instead of boys, but uh, he definitely uh, enjoys the girls and the different uh, different pace that they bring on. Um, but honestly, just uh, uh, definitely a good role model to have growing up and try to do a lot of the things with my girls and my kids that he did with us uh, growing up. So, uh, yeah. Okay, I want to tell you about my teaching. Uh, everyone says to be a special ed teacher, you have to be a, an extra special person. Not only do you have to have the talents of working with individual kids at different levels of um, intelligence, but you also have to have the big heart to go with it. I can guarantee that Mike had that, and I've witnessed that from what kids have come up and talked to him uh, many years ago and even now to this day. And I personally have a personal thing when uh, we had a photography business and we were doing a wedding of one of his students, and one of the students came up to me and said, are you Mrs. Fisher? And I said, yes. I thought, uh-oh, what am I getting into? And she says, I gotta say thank you for what your husband did for me. I work at McDonald's, and if he didn't continue to go over the math skills, the checking, the money, and all those items that he helped us with, I wouldn't have a job to this day. Mike doesn't think he touched anybody's lives, and I know that he, he certainly has, because I've watched it all happen. Um, Mike has excelled in everything he's touched on. He has been the best husband, dad, pup up. He was a football player too, not only in high school, but also in the Navy when we got to travel to Japan. He also was a photographer in our business that we had for 20 years. He was a coach, a coach not only for, for basketball, but for football too. He was a fireman. He was in the JCs. He was a great teacher, he was a Navy guy, and he was a scoutmaster for many, many years. Mike has always been my biggest support system, the love of my life, 
and I will love him and be thankful that we've walked this journey of life together. I'll love him forever. God has blessed us for 53 plus years. And if people think you don't have ups and downs, even being married this long, they're not living the right li life because Mike and I are very opposite in a lot of ways. We've had a lot of ups and downs, but we realize that we have to work together to make things the best. And I believe during this journey for Mike and I with our, our time together in our marriage, we have had the best of the best all together. And I thank you, Mike, for that good good time and love for all these years. Hello, Mr. Fisher. Um, it is a pleasure to say thank you for all that you've done for me. Um, I was the quiet one in the back of the room that didn't uh, say anything that would kept to myself. I had, uh, you know, I had low self-esteem, I had ADD, dyslexia, all that, and you helped me with uh, showing me how to solve math problems, how to uh, work on um, my tests and um, you knew that school was very, very tough for me. I didn't like school. I didn't want to be there. Uh, being in your class and the other class, Mrs. Dean, uh, helped me to understand a world that uh, was confusing to me. When you have a learning disability, it's very tough to um, learn with other kids in another classroom, but you made it very different. You made it fun. Your personality actually calmed my uh, stress, my nerves, my anxiety down to zero. It was fun being in your class when you drew upside down on, on paper on your desk to make uh, figures. And it was funny to see you um, break rules um, that a teacher shouldn't break. Um, I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate your, your laughter uh, when we hang out, when we go out and do things. Uh, I look at you more as a friend now than a teacher because even though we've, uh, even though I've graduated and I've moved on, um, you still have that title in my mind. And I don't think me or any other student will ever put you totally in that box of, okay, he's no longer a, a teacher, he's a friend. So you will always be a friend now you're more like a father figure to me um, in certain ways, and that means a lot. And you've helped me to mature. You were with me at the hardest times of my life and my other friend as well uh, when I went through some really bad times. Um, but I also uh, worked with you uh, and Peggy with your business. That was very challenging at the beginning and quite interesting and very fun. Um, so I thank you for what you did. I thank you for being the person that you are. Um, thank you for being um, genuine, kind, considerate, acceptant of me and others like me that didn't know how to be accepted in a world that is so um, confusing. And I thank God that he brought me into your life and you into my life. So I thank you that we give this video over to you and I hope you enjoy it and it blessed you. And have a great time. Bye-bye.